So this is like the pre-intro intro to this episode. But first, I want to tell you really quickly, the Meaningful Minute team worked on something so amazing and we just launched this past week and that is pause. Your life is hectic. Your life is full of stress. You're not sure what to do. You need to slow down. You need to pause. You need to focus on your mental health. And that's why Meaningful Minute, the team, along with Dr. Benji Epstein, created this program called Pause. We have a WhatsApp status. You can sign up to the link is in the description in the show notes. This is a platform that is focused on mental health, breathing exercises, mindfulness. And if you're here on Spotify, Apple, Meaningful Minute app, we have a new podcast called Pause. So go ahead, search it on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast, search Pause, Meaningful Minute, it'll come up and listen to it. It's time that you take your mental health seriously. Now enjoy the intro to this episode with Itzy Waldner. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this episode of the Meaningful People Podcast. And oh, now he's feeling very melodious. Because we sat down with Yitzi Waldner, <laughs> who, by the way, probably has one of the sweetest voices in the entire industry. And he's not a singer. He's a writer. He is a singer, though. Well, he, he is a singer. As you'll learn. But he, he totally is a singer. But he primarily like looks at himself as a writer. But he's making that move right he's now. Draw, yeah. You know, he's trying to be that singer-songwriter now, and I think he'll be very successful because his voice is amazing. It really is. It's so sweet. Even his talking voice. Soft. So um, if you're a music person, you're going to love this episode. Even if you're not a music person, there's so much here. There's so much halogicity in this episode. And we'd like to give a big thank you to our friend. You're not a music person. There are some people. I've met someone. People I'm like, are not music people? I asked, do you like music? They're like, yeah, I don't really like music. I'm like, do you have a heart? They love music. They just don't know yet. Exactly. Well, maybe you'll know now. Uh, a big thank you to our friend, Isaac Newman. Uh, Isaac, Isaac, Isaac at Sadik. What a guy. Isaac, Isaac Newman. Thank How you, are you, dude? Thank you so much, uh, you know, for sponsoring this episode. Isaac Hanishmas, your mother. Rechama Peral Malkaleya, Bas Ari Leib. Neshama Shev, an aliyah. All the chizak, the inspiration that's derived in this episode should be an aliyah for your neshama. Amen. Big thank you also to Moshe Majeski. You know Moshe Majeski? Sure. Good friend of mine. Appreciate you, Moshe. You are the guy, the Moshe group. Really appreciate you. Um, Moshe! And you know who you met last week that we're talking about again? Who did I meet last week? Mark Hershkowitz from Very ILS. Deep. Well, you need to go to infinity and beyond. You're sitting by your title table. You're all ready. It's a closing. It's nerve wracking. You're signing papers. You're signing papers. And there's an empty seat across from you. Where is title? Where is title? <laughs> Where are they? They're late. Maybe they're in the delivery room. They're in traffic. You won't have those horror stories when it comes to using ILS. Because ILS. they go... To infinity and beyond. Because they are there for you no matter what. Rain, snow, shine, tish above, Yom Kippur. Not Yom Kippur. That's erroneous. They're not going to be there for you on Yom Kippur. <laughs> and that's why you should choose ILS because they also value Hashem and the laws of the Torah. What is happening right now? I don't know. But we have gone off the rails, people. We have gone to infinity and, and beyond. Which is ILSTitle.com. So go ahead. And welcome back, Nachi. And if you're not sure, thank you. <laughs> and if you're not sure... If you're like, let's say your mortgage broker is taking care of title, your lawyer is taking care of title, just say, hey, lawyer, hey, suit guy, can you make sure that we have ILS as our title company? Because I don't want anybody else. Very deep. And he'll say, sure, no problem. I'm calling Mark right now. And you need to call ILSTitle.com. Uh, yeah, Yitzi Walner, what a yid. Maybe you didn't know that. Sholy Walner is his brother. I didn't know. I had no idea. But they're brothers, both in the music industry. You'll hear a lot about his upbringing, his life. Um, and it was so much fun being able to sit down with a, with a singer songwriter, someone who has composed so many hits in the Jewish world. Like literally like every chuppah song, every song song, uh, was, was He's written. done incredible work over the years and he continues to do amazing things. Yeah. And I appreciated seeing sort of that window into what goes on before you hear the song actually yeah. happen. Because by the time we hear the song, it's like yeah. at the wedding or on you know, it's streaming or on the CD, wherever you hear it, there's so much, there's a journey that went into creating that. And it's also, we, we, we hear in this episode, it's just so, so much part of their soul, mm -hmm. you know? But anyways, you'll hear from him. This is Yitzi Waldner. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. Oh wow, you really playing that? That's good. Hashem, yeah, You know, has to. I was with a Has concert not too long ago, and I was speaking to the Chevra, and Yitzi Walner tells me, who's our guest here tonight, 
Rip you see Wallner. He Thank says, uh, I was in Hass 2. I said, you were in Hass 2. We're at Hass 36. Oh, I, I got to tell you, this mic is as close as possible to the mouth. Got it. So you could, it, you could move it, this, that, whatever. But yeah, not like a singing mic. It's very that, perfect. Yeah. I know the mic. I mean, I'm familiar it's with it. It's a very nice it's, mic, no? It's a great mic. Yeah, thank you. It's not expensive. It's like Yeah. No, there are many studio artists who like recording this because it comes in very flat. They don't yeah. have anything. They don't give me no high frequency, no nothing. They sing Just, on this? Some th- like seeing this, and then they do whatever they want to do to it afterwards. Post. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I, I said, has two. Hmm. I said, yeah, I had my solo. What was your solo? Shema Hashem V'chaneni. Wow. wow. What, what group was that part of? Pirche. I wasn't Pirche. part of Pirche, but they brought me in to sing the solo and be part of Pirche for the concert. That's awesome. Yeah. So music was, uh, music was part of your life growing up? What would you say? Uh, yeah, I mean, we all love music. Who doesn't love music, right? But I grew up to Mordechai and David, Alvin Freed, you know, they, they were the mains, especially yeah. in the 80s. Um, Silver Zemmer, Miami Boys. We were very into it. Yeah, we, we loved it. We loved it. And um, I guess take us through the early years in the Waldner home. You know, you're huge on the music scene. If people don't know who you are, then they, I don't know, maybe they don't listen to Jewish music. Um, but you've written... Hundreds? Yeah. Thousands, yeah. maybe? No, 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 no. We're not there yet. <laughs> maybe when we'll be 80, you'll re interview me again. <laughs> maybe. No, but you've written thousands? Hun- I think so. Yeah. Hundreds of hits, like hundreds of really big Baruch songs Hashem. in the Jewish world. And we'll get to them. But, but I'm curious as a young, as a young Itzy Waldner, like, what's that? Is that like intentional? Like, oh, I'm going to be a composer. I want to compose, compose music. Right. It's a great question. So we, we're, Basically a family of singers, you know, like we mentioned before, my brother Sholy Waldner is a, is a real veteran, you know, highly sought after wedding singer. Um, and we could even now come together, the four, we're four brothers, and without rehearsing nothing, just pick a song, excuse me, and it'll sound like we just rehearsed for three hours. Wow. We love singing together, really? harmonies and blah, blah, blah. I was always the kid doing the harmonies, and my father was always telling me, stop, sing straight, you know, but... <laughs> But we love harmonizing, and Sholi was always the one doing the lead. I have a younger brother, Maishi, always doing the lead, you know, great voice. And um, so I guess being the harmonizer always brought out a different element of music in me, not doing the straight line, always trying to go somewhere else. But um, growing up, I sang from with Sheish in 1984, 85, even 86 or whatever. And I sang in Hask, as you mentioned. Um, so I did, I did a lot of singing, but as a teenager... A lot of, you know, more music came out. Daddy, Shlomo Samcha. Totally different. That was like a turn of an era, no? Right. And, and, and I loved it. There was so much fresh music coming out and I connected so much to it. And I said, something in me just wanted to write. It's something to be the singer, very nice. But when you can materialize that into the world, actually bring that into the world, be that pipeline to bring that kind of inspiration in, uh, was tremendous. And I, I always wanted to do that. I wasn't so active. I wrote my first song when I was 12. What song? But, do you know? Do you remember what it was? I remember. I'd probably be arrested for theft because it was stolen from all different <laughs> parts of the, you know, different songs. But I wrote it for a play in C A Y. Anybody who sees this podcast, well, they were in Cambodia, Ram in '87 or so, whatever. They'll remember. Um, yeah, song called "I'm Not Seach. But then I parked it because you know, like I said, too many parts stolen from here and there. But I, I, it was a construct. It was something that I could say, hey, you know, this is something that has emotion. Right. But then I went, you know, I learned, I went to Yeshiva, and I there's still did some singing. I sang for Shmuel Kunda. I remember uh, the Magic Yamaka. Sure. You do? Keep out, yeah. keep I wish. That was me. Wow. Yeah. Al Vashalom, Shmuel Kunda, Al Vashalom. And I sang for Country Yassi, Hamal Chagoyal. Oh, my gosh. Another song, uh, Kivi and Toki. My yeah. wife's family is going crazy right now. I, when I got married, like, I was, I growing up, I'm freed, you know, when I have been David, who else? Yehuda? Remember who's, you remember sure. You, you remember Yehuda? Sure. sure. Just Yehuda exclamation, exclamation mark. Yeah. Yehuda exclamation mark. So like right. him and and then Ira Heller maybe? Yeah, of course. Went to the homo act sometimes and he was he there. Was, he was big in Hass too. And originally <laughs> Ira Heller, I'm really throwing these names that out. That O-Hell concert. O-Hell concert. Oh, right. That's that what it big, is. That big, that double CD. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. O-Hell right, concert. Right. But my, when, I got, featured. when I got married, like they were my wife sailing, they were like singing like these country Yussi stuff. I was like, what is this? Like you don't know country Yussi? I'm like... Oh, what's country Yussi? I've had a mental note, by the way, since you mentioned that your father would redirect you away from the harmony. Mm-hmm. Just ra- random story. I don't know if you know Ellie Schwab. 
He's a he's a composer. He wrote sure. a few, you know sure, Ezra, sure. Yeah. awesome guy sure. here from the. I don't know him personally, but I, I mean right. yeah for sure. He's written some some big hits. Of course, I worked with him a little bit when he was writing for Yaakov. Yeah, yeah. He he Scar wrote Mitzvah. Uh, Scar Mitzvah Scar Mitzvah from Mordechai. Right, right, sure. right, right, right. So anyway, he told me once when he was a bocher in yeshiva. So he was always singing harmony by Shalashudis, and he overheard two bocherim bickering. One said to the other, "This guy's going off tune." Guy's like going <laughs> off the tune. So the other guy says, "No, it's harmony. It's better than the tune." <laughs> was it? Fun, it wasn't funny. It's better than the tune. You know what's funny? You remind me of a story very similar. When I moved to Lakewood and I, I joined the little stable and we we it was a little, it was a really small crowd, and someone who now actually is one of my closest friends, a of mine, and I was singing with Shal Shutz. We started singing, and I I started doing these really. Ridiculous harmonies, you know, <laughs> would really would have upset my father at that point, you know. But it was like very inverted stuff and crazy. And he came up to me and he says, "You're to you're going off tune, I think. Aren't you going off? Tune? It's funny that you remember reminding me of the story. So aren't you going off tune?" I said, "No, let me teach you. Come here. I said, you sing this. I'll go ah." And I said, let, "Let me show you some things." And since then, he started like really focusing in. He was like, "Wow, it opened up a whole new world. Like you never knew paint existed, you know." About. So like it's a whole new era you're talking. You're talking about Simcha, Daddy, right? So I ain't did I ain't did I. Daddy's like the hype guy of this century, you know? Yeah, he gets up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, all that energy. So when they came out, yeah, I had such an appreciation to the new music that whether Yossi Green was writing, well, it was primarily Yossi Green then. And I said, I, I gotta be him. I gotta be him. Forget the singers. I gotta be him, but even though he's behind the scenes somewhat. I said, there's just something, and I felt that, that I had it. You know, a natural uh, uh, leniency or something. Uh, uh, that was Matthias. a unique relationship between Yossi Green and Deddy because all of sure. those albums he that produces were just that, he turned out, right? It was all Yossi's compositions, right? Right, right. right. It, it was right. rare. Tell me if I'm wrong. Right? It's rare to have one composer take an artist all the so way. So I think because an album he, like he was that. involved in the actual production of the album, and he took him under his wings and said, "Look, I'm going to." write for you and I'm going to bring you to level X and that's pretty much what happened and he he gave him his identity yeah and whatever he sang just like stuck it was like, boom, boom, that was boom. a model shift right because Martha and Avremo they weren't working right. with although, one composer although, although, although I think Fried and Yossi Green were very very uh, tight in a working relationship and there was so many songs that Yossi Green you know with his other album, Tanya and all that happened through Yossi Green and even Martha did a lot of stuff with Yossi Green Yossi was the kochav of writing I and mean, he still is but he reinvented the wheel in music. I mean, it's unbelievable what so he did. So you, you looked at the Yossi Green of the world and you're like, I looked at Yossi I saying, I got to kind of, I got to try to be that guy. Not because of the fame. I didn't care about the fame. I was never one that cared about it. Even as a kid, when I was doing all the stages and all the albums, it didn't mean anything to me. But to be, to try to be the creator, which when I'm saying creator, we all know it's all in Hashem. There's nothing yeah. here. It's only what Hashem gives me. And I'm, like I said, I'm just a pipeline and whatever comes out. But, but to be the one that, to bring it into this world, you know, it was not here. And now the singer is singing this because of what fell into my head. That's the beauty of music. You know, I, I said this, I said this over, I think, Tiako Shweki at the Haas concert. I was, you were there with me. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, he helped me, he helped translate a, a lot for me because I don't speak great Hebrew or I don't speak Hebrew at all, in <laughs> period. And I was sitting next to like Itzik Dadia and Akiva and we're all like trying to communicate with each other, but I have no clue what they're saying. They don't know what I'm saying. It's like really just like. So it's going really well. <laughs> it was going very well. Shalom bias. Yeah. It was, it was some, yeah. But music, you know, pierces through all language. Yeah, transcends yeah. language. It's like yeah. music, and even with, you know, Yaakov had said, even with, with special children, and we've got Hask, Special Children's right. Center. Right. Music, what this does for these pe what these for these kids, for these yeah. people, it's yeah. incredible. It, we, we call music, you know, language of the heart, language of the right. soul. It doesn't need to be any words even. It just, just, the fact that this note can move you and do this, and it'll do the same thing to that guy, and to that guy, and to this woman, to that person, which means that we all relate to the same emotion when this particular thing is sung. It's so like last week's parasha, you know, the shira, you know? Yeah. So was, yeah. It was my bar mitzvah parasha, so I did the shira, and, uh -huh. but like, it's one of the most pivotal moments for Klai Yisrael. And they did it together. Yeah, and what are we doing? We're singing. We're singing, right. Shira la shem ki go, go. Like, right. every week, the parasha, you're leaning, eh, eh, it's trap, 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 but leaving with rhyme. Boom. The Ramban says that that singing, song, music is the closest thing to Rachnias in Gashmias form. Really? Yeah. Imagine that. Rachnias, we don't understand what it is. It's completely spiritual. 
music, we can hear, I mean, we can't see it, but we can hear it. And the Ramban says that it is the closest thing to Rachnius in an Gashmias form. Wow. In, in, in materialistic form, the closest thing to spirituality is music. Shivalt. It's incredible. Yeah. I think what we're seeing today, just to, to move for a minute based on what you just said, mm-hmm. modern day contemporary artists are doing things with music that are awakening souls that historically didn't have shaykhs to music that was coming out of the Kaisle based medrash. Right. Artists, you mentioned Akiva, artists like Yishai Rebo are, are at the forefront of this, and they're using music to access people's soul, to access the heart, and they're singing, their lyrics are incredibly spiritual right. and rooted right. in... Right, so I, and, I, think, and, I think part of that happened, um, obviously they took it to a whole new level, but I think there was an, up to a certain point, we were doing songs, basically, Sokim, Amar Chazal, yeah. you know, and all that. Um, then came the era of the Hebrew, you know, Ivrit. And it just exploded. Whether it was, uh, let's say, you know, Yaakov with Libya Ba Mizrach or Ed Rikod, you know, that was just exploded. Or Benny Friedman with um, Yeshtikva or Ivri Anoichi or... You know, those songs that just suddenly exploded and, and what, what happened here? Why did that become so popular? It didn't like become big. It became, it was like a whole, it was like a revolution in music. Like what happened? So I think, you know, when you sing a Pasuk in Tehillim and Tehillim is Nitzchias, it's those words will last forever and, and we don't understand the Kedusha in those words. But for the Hamaynam, for the layman, to be able to just, let me, let me speak to you, your language that you'll understand. Yesh tikva, you know, so you understand the words yesh tikva, there's hope, and if it's, if it's interpreted right within the notes, you're going right to the heart. So Akiva and Yishai Ribon, you know, that whole genre, they took it to a whole other level, speaking to so many people around the world that are maybe that are not affiliated and say, hey, it just, just woke me up, it struck a chord, no pun intended. Yeah. No pun intended. Yeah. I was at the Tamar Festival, which is a, a music festival in Israel, mm-hmm. It usually happens around Sukkot time, and I was I had the opportunity to be in Eretz for Sukkot a few years ago, and the Tamar Festival was featuring all secular artists plus Yishai Rebo, mm. and it it occurred over the course of a couple of days, and like I knew when Yishai was going to be performing, and it was at the foot it was in Hechal Masada, at the foot of Masada Mountain outdoor venue, wow. ten thousand Jews. We could not get a minion from Myriv. And there were 10,000 Jews there. Wow. And Yishai Rebo's on the stage with his tzitzis out, his yarmulke, his, all, his whole band is, <clears throat> is from. And it's unbelievable what's happening. Yeah, he's, he's completely turned, you know, the Chiloni music world on his head. I mean, you could have 20,000 people at a venue and they're all crying after he explains, their, uh, you know... Uh, a medrash, and then it just he takes them there. And it's just he, it's an incredible, incredible thing he's doing, and and that's really what we said. Music is really the language of yeah. the soul. I remember leaving one of his concerts in LL last in a couple years ago, LL and King's Theater, and it was such a, it was such a kedusha, a kedusha like an experience, right? And I was like, I don't know if I'd go to another Ishiru concert. You know, I've been there, done that. It's great, amazing, but if it's an LL, I'll go because there's something. You know that there's, it's just I there's, don't know. there's no you know they say callous rush you know it's not there's no party atmosphere it's it's all in for spirituality and inspiration that's really what the whole thing is right so would you say that your you know your first big break maybe or in the industry was working with maybe Yaakov Shreki and and his stuff right so if you want to go like, to our regular scheduled program. <laughs> <laughs> We do that a lot. <laughs> right, great. Close parentheses. Yeah. Um, Listen, we're, not talking, we're not talking about breeding lizards this episode. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, last time. So basically, right, we stayed in the, we stayed in the island of music yeah. here, right? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I've worked with quite a few people before Yaakov, and uh, I worked with Shlemy Dax, and I worked with, um, I think it might have been Daddy was also at that point a little bit. Um, what, did you, what did you write for Shlemy? Shlemy Dax? Tzama, Tzama Lecha. If you guys know the song? <laughs> What's that? You know the song? I, I can't say that I know this song. Someone I did a new song, Welcome Home. There's a candle seemed to say, Welcome Home. There's another song. I did Moshe of Nathra, which is a disco. We did a few, quite a few songs with him. 
Um, but then, yeah, I mean, look, there was no social media back then, so the songs were a little bit limited to whoever was buying the CD, which were plenty, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but who wrote what and how popular the song became was still limited in a way. But then, yeah, then I remember uh, I wrote for Yaakov. Uh, I'd met Yaakov Riskman. I remember he pulled up in front of my house, and he, this, I still live in Brooklyn at the time. He asked me to come down to listen to Annette to a demo um, of the singer, and I'm listening to the singer, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Who is this guy? He says his name is Shweki. I said, what is that, a shawarma sandwich? Well, I never yeah. heard it. Because really up to that point, there were no Svartim really in our industry. Really? really? No, there weren't. Chaim Yisrael was No. Israel. First of all, he was after that. And he was in Israel. And even that, he was real. Joe Amar was the... Yeah, but that's... You're right. Back in He's, the day. Right. It wasn't really our music. Okay. Someone singing Ashkenaz music, that happens to be a Svarti, or at least a half a Svarti anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it wasn't that was something, anything we knew. And, and his voice to me was just incredible. I said, wow. I said, I said you're going to make a lot of money here. You got to sign this guy. <laughs> and he says, uh, he says, yeah, we're close. You know, he says, okay, so get writing, you know. Um, so I wrote, I actually had what, written. What was it about Yaakov that, that struck um, you? What I loved about his voice side, yeah. right away. Because you just heard audio, meaning right. if you were to see video, he has this. Right, it wasn't his personality. Yeah. Well, he, he, I don't even think he was married then yet. He was actually getting married then. Wow. He was getting married a few months later. I, he sang Mehera at the wedding, at his own wedding. And you wrote that I wrote Mehera. Mehera. I wrote Mehera for that album, Habeit Mishamayim, that song and a few other songs. But anyway, so what I loved about his voice, uh, what I connected to was that many singers, when they go high, when they start going higher in the higher ranges, their vocals become usually very thin and nasally. It's, and it's normal. I'm the same way. And when he just pulled up second, third register, he just stayed wide and big and beautiful and, and just warm. And I said, wow, that's a voice I can write for. That's, I just connected. Um, and really the rest is history. I mean, we've- What was the first, the, the first song that you can remember that you wrote for him and he comes into so the right, studio? So, so the, first, the first songs I wrote for him was for that album, Mehera, which was still going on today. Which is quite incredible. Us, uh, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. a hit through through the ages. It's yeah. a classic. It's a yeah. classic. It's we always talk about what song. Yeah, it's what really songs. unbelievable. It's it's it's, it's a timeless nigga. You know, I remember when that album came out, and 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 I had no idea what was going on because, like, a you know, there's no social media, and I I still you know, hack music was still relegated to the but the Midrash and wasn't really so much in in the homes, and I was already married with kids and working. I wasn't like so into the hack of music. And I remember I had a wedding in Cleveland. And a cousin of mine got married, and I went over to the, and I'm, I was, my, somebody wanted me to do a song there, not even Mahera, just some other song for an album that I produced for someone else. And uh, I walked up to the band guy, uh, Sam Khaman, and I said, um, I said, this is 20 something years ago, I said, uh, my name is Itzi Waldner, and I, I'm going to do this song. So I, he says, You're the one who wrote Mahera? This is like a half a year after the Yaakov's album came out already. I said, Mahera, he says, Yeah, from Shweki. I said, You know the song? <laughs> He says, no, the song. He says, we play it every night. Wow. And I said, hang on a second. I walked out. I called Yochi Brisman. I said, and I hear him. He's sitting up by a wedding. He's all busy. I said, Yochi, I'm in Cleveland. The guy tells me that, uh, you know, he knows the song. He said, were you living under a rock? Boom. And he hangs up the phone. <laughs> like, okay, maybe it is a big song. Or maybe you're living under a rock. <laughs> I guess I'm living under a rock. Both are true. And, and that's it, when you decided it, to move to Lakewood. And that, <laughs> <laughs> right. If our park is a rock, right? You can live under a rock in Lakewood, but it's probably a lot nicer rock. Right, <laughs> yeah. Bigger rock, like yeah. an acre rock, yeah. But anyway, um, so that really took off. And, and remember then I felt a little disheartened because Rachim became so big. And we all thought Habet was going to be the head of the album. Habet, Mishamayim, Mishamayim. And we were all excited about it. They put a song number three and it was going to be... And then Rachim comes out of left field and just takes over. Like no wrote, song exists, no singer exists. It's Rachim. Who wrote Rachim? Pinky Weber. Pinky Weber. Really? Yeah. And I was like, oh man, you know, here we go. But 20 years later, and I'm thinking like, Rachim, no one ever heard of anymore. <laughs> I, Pinky, I love you, but I'm just saying. There was literally an album released called I'm So Sick of Rachim. Right. Rachim, yeah, I'm so Roba. sick of yeah, Rachim. So, yeah. yeah, um, defam- defamation on that one. <laughs> big time. And, um, and but, parody, Mahera, but, but, but I walked into a wedding and I was at a chuppah recently and they're still playing Mehera. It's amazing. And to me, there's such a chizik like, that really made it to the point where it's like, it's unbelievable. There's so many Chuppa songs around today and they're still playing something that's 20 years old. It really goes through that they're connecting. Do you remember writing Mahira? Was there like a... Yeah. I'm wondering what that process looked like. Uh, primitive. I didn't know what I was doing back then. I mean, 
I was practicing. I, I was still playing around with the keyboard. I wasn't so well, but I was writing from my heart, really. It wasn't it, something yeah, that, uh, yeah. I just let it go. Just, I got myself out of the way and let it go. And um, Yaakov loved it right away. Yaakov loved it right away. Um, and then the next album followed. We did Mi Bon Siach and Al Naroiz Bovel. That was that. Then the next album already I had, I think, Eishas Chayel, I think that, or Sameach, one of the two. And we did Shema, Shema, all well, that, and Mama, Mama. You wrote Shema? Yeah. That's a beautiful song. Thank you. Wow. The, the, the English lyrics, the Hebrew lyrics, all that, like, you know, I, w- I would think, uh, someone not in the industry, that there are composers that will, you know, excel in writing the Hebrew the Hebrew songs. And uh, English lyrics is a totally different maybe niche or, or skill set. But you've, you've done both, right? No, Very so nice I'm so. not the lyricist on these songs, although I do work with a lot of the lyricists. And, like Miriam Israeli. Right. And, and I'll give her, you know, like, let's say, you know, the song uh, We Are Miracle, right? Yeah. So when I gave her the demo, it already had a nation in the desert. We started out as slaves. You know, made it to the motherland, then, then came the crusades. I was like, don't keep those words, just put in different words. Place all this. And she's like, yeah. She was like, no, we're keeping these words. I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, I think you're a lyricist. <laughs> By the so way. I don't Oops. like to consider myself as one because then it just makes my job harder. I yeah. like putting in place all the lyrics, but I find that many times because it comes with the song and the lyrics really is the, is kind of is like the channel for the emotion of the song. So usually it winds up sticking a lot of, a lot of the words. I want to ask you, I think it's really, really cool. And specifically with this, with this industry and what you do, I don't think it's replicated in many, even, um, uh, you know, artistic fields that you're taking literally something from nothing, right? Zilch, nada. And you're creating a sound, a song. And then that, that thing in which you created on your keyboard at 2 AM with no, with little sleep, with a, you know, maybe a coffee or whatever, could then literally be listened to by tens, if not hundreds of millions of people. Yeah. And yeah. You, you know, you're not the guy singing it. You're again, that behind the scenes guy who wrote that in his, you know, yeah. basement, in his garage. Do you think about that? And like, what's that feeling like to, to do something like that? So this, it's really two parts that you're asking here. Uh, first saying that you created something out of nothing. I'm just going to go on that. Hashkaf, I think for a second, I always remind myself, there's no yesh ma'ayin, only Hashem creates something out of nothing. There's no more ain chadash tachas Hashemesh. There's no new under the, the sun. It's all there. It's just you're bringing it down. Every composer will tell you that the moment you write that song, it's a, you can't describe it. And therefore, it's not natural and it's not human. It's just, it's something that just falls in. It's, a, it's, like a, it's almost like a small navia. You can't explain it otherwise. It's just something that comes in. No one's really that talented. It just you're just a channel, for for whatever reason Hashem chose you to bring that right. song to the world, and when you get that those goosebumps, wow, it's just beautiful and just like let me put this out and send this to this guy, that guy, and he tells you no, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> right? There goes the Navia, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, addressing it's your second, checker also, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be stoned, but anyway, um, addressing your second point, that's a great point. Uh, and I remember the first time it really hit me, and again, being in a world where there was no, still, social media was still limited back then, so, and the emails and reaching out and hearing stories how songs change people's lives. When I remember when I wrote Eishas Chayel, Eishas Chayel, and I remember when I wrote it, I wrote it literally coming down from my second floor to my first floor. <laughs> 80% so, of that. And so many of us sing that. 80% like so of that. And I remember when I wrote it, it was Shorty Yaakov, and we, we, we pissed it up a little here and a little there, and then whatever album was put out, that was it. Many years ago, I mean, many years go by, and someone sends me a clip from a YouTube comment on Aisha's Chayel. And the, the comment says, you know, she's, she, this song saved my life. And she's a girl in Israel. She, I think she was 15, 16 years old. She grew up not from father coming coming from Kipatsuga kind of guy, whatever, trying to get the mother to become, wasn't interested. And she writes that she was on the way home to school and one of her friends show her this song. And she said every Arab Shabbos her father used to ask the mother to light candles she didn't want. So she was so moved by the song, she came in and told the father, Tashir ima, sing this to mommy Arab Shabbos. And he went, he sang it to her and she says, to see the smile on her mother's face was just unbelievable. Wow. So let me fast forward a year. She says something along these lines. I remember exact story. Uh, she's kosher. She's fully from, and the mother already comes and lights candles. And this is years after I wrote the song. 
that's when it really hit me right about how far and how powerful music is i could just you know so much of it comes in and pops out six thousand miles away there's going to be from generations from that song Evolve. It's, it's, Evolve. Unbelievable. it's really unbelievable it's i really, want to use this. it's so much more powerful than me than even yako so much singing. bigger yeah so much more bigger than that little event we'll be right back to this episode of meaningful people podcast right back. right back ah i beat him to it um okay close your eyes everybody who's listening to this close your eyes Uh oh close your eyes give me a i close my eyes okay mm, you're sitting there if you're, one second, if you're driving, don't close your eyes. <laughs> it's not a good idea. I did not sign up for this, by the way. I don't know what's happening right now. Mm, you're sitting there and you're imagining what your life is like 10 years from now. Mm, <laughs> and you look in your bank account. What do you see? Um, do you see money or do you see debt? Um, you see money because you went with Moshe Alpert and he's going to make sure that in 10 years from now that your life is a whole lot more secure than it is today. So reach out to Moshe Alpert. That's alpertmoshe at gmail.com or you go ahead and give him a call, you know, disrupt him during dinner time. Why not? 718-644-1594. That's his number. Give him a call because in 10 years from now, when you close your eyes, um, you want to see green. What do you think? I, I don't know. I don't know what is <laughs> happening right now. Like legit. Last time, the last ad, we sort of went off the rails. I feel like here we started. I can't even see the rails in our rear view. We're, in, right we're in the bushes right now. I cannot even see the rails. But you know what color bushes are, right? They're green. Very deep. Call Moshe Alper. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of this episode. Thank you, Moshe. Thank you for your support. I want to use this illustration to address i've gotten some feedback we've released a lot of different types of episodes right. a lot of different types of meaningful people and i've gotten feedback when we feature someone in the music industry asking me some coming from a very innocent place what's the meaningful inion that you're bringing out from the music industry right right and it's this very illustration that you're talking about. And, right. and there's other meaning, of course, that we can highlight as well. But right. right here, you're talking about someone that had a piece of music come down from a pipeline from the Eberster into your neshama that you articulated to an artist that has impacted Doris of from people. Right. It's wild. At, right. Like it's a direct impact right. of, a, of a meaningful impact that you're having on Yiddish Kinder right. all over the world. Right. It's such a clear case for for what you're doing. Right. It's so it, it's so Halig. I want to take you back also to you mentioned um you mentioned uh Yesh mm -hmm. that only the Abishter is a uh, is a creator. I saw I think from uh Rabbi Dr. Akiva Tatz. Sure. He writes that um one of one of our big avoidances is to emulate the Abishter. Allah the Bedrochov. Yeah. So the same way the Eberster is a Rachum, Ahu Rachum, Afata Rachum, right. to be compassionate and to emulate all of the aspects and, and midas of the Eberster. Eberster is a creator. So in what way are we able to emulate this, that the Eberster is a, a boire, a creator? We're not able to create anything. So Rabbi Dr. Akiva Tatz writes that exercising Bechira is an exercise in Yesh Me'ayin mm. because the choice that we make Nothing dictates that choice. That choice right. doesn't exist right. prior. Right. And our choosing is our closest that we come to Yesh Me'ayin in our, in our exercise of Bechir. Incredible. But maybe an expansion of that is what you're talking about. Music composition is how we emulate the Eibishter. Right. Right. It, it's really amazing. Malachim sing Shira, right? Yeah. So Shira is obviously an incredible part you know, of Avdus Hashem. Mashiach comes, you know, Olivium, and that's that's a big part of that's a big part, right? Right. It's a big the music part that they used to sing to get a person when he brought a carbon. They used to break him down to cry to come to tshuva to come to. So music is as a powerful effect. Look, I think maybe what they're trying to say is they're maybe on a level where music is not needed so much. Um, so it's possible that when they're asking you, "What are you showing with this?" That maybe for them they don't need it. They don't right. need that aspect, and they, I think, maybe to be you know, music has become such a much about idolizing and selfies and pictures and this and that. So, 
people have a wrong vision of what really music is. And it's really not, I know right. all the singers and they're tzaddikim one by one. They're, no matter what they look like on Instagram or this and that, the neshamas are just incredible. Gewalt. Two points oh. I want to make, one based off of that. So it's funny you had mentioned that uh, you call Yochi with a song. The, the, my brother Yochan, he wrote a song, Pischili, for Simcha Lion. Right. It was, yeah, a it was a title track, and I don't even think he knew when he wrote it. Yo, how track. are you, dude? <laughs> and he was just in the studio. Where would he go? <laughs> he went home to his kids, probably. Maybe he wants to perform right now. Yeah, but um, we, my family chat was getting this demo. We're like, oh, it's nice, it's very nice. And Yochi said to him, "Did you write this?" He's like, "Yeah, why?" He's like, "No, no, no. where do you get it from? Like, you, you hear? <laughs> is it? Is there a song that you got this from? Because <laughs> the song is not." This is not Pasha. This is an unbelievable song. And like my brother maybe wrote a little bit, but he was completely unknown in, in the industry. And here he goes writing a title track for an up and coming guy like Simcha Liner, who, who that, which then was sang by, was sang by Chuppas for the next five years, every Chuppa. Right, right. It's like, you didn't write, like you didn't write this, right? <laughs> like it couldn't have been, right? Yeah. But that's, uh, again, it, it talks to that sort of that <clears throat> Hashem places, he places things in, yeah. Within music, but also in everything. Right. It could be words. It could be music. It could be actions. Right. Right. Can't uh, underestimate yourself for, for what your mission is. Yeah. Ima imagine that, that they say Rabbi Miller, he once he once came at the shul and there was a young man there. And the guy like like this, you know, shook his head in the morning and you know, just, just went by and he says, uh, the mission says, but save upon me off. I said, give me a smile. Look at me, your ear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> give me your ear like this. Give me a smile. My point is that even a smile, why do we have to smile to somebody else? Because a, a happy countenance can change a guy's day. Sure. Just a smile, let alone saying a good word or a song or a tire, whatever it is, you never know. Yeah. What you guys do here, you're changing, no doubt. Baruch Shem. Thousands of people, thousands of people. And this, it's, and it, it, like this you medium said, here is incredible. It's not, and it's so much bigger than us. You know, yeah, like, exactly. we're, I feel very blessed, and I know Momo does as well, to be able to, to, to Hashem, given the platform that we have to sit in this seat and do what we do and try not to mess it up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, because it's really about the people sitting across yeah, from us. Our just to get out of the way. Yeah, you know, but I've heard, we've heard such, such stories, you know. I was thinking on the way in, that I, I think these platforms, you know, today's goal is, is unlike, I mean, not that I'm a thousand years old, but, yeah. but I, we all know what today's goal is and the challenges they just walk out on the street. And I think this is the crutch you know, these kind of platforms and, and music and tire, obviously, and all the tire that's available online today. For that reason, it's the crutch that we need today to be able to survive this gullus. Yeah, it's just incredible. I totally hear you. Do, you. do you think also, you know, getting into that, what you mentioned, like the selfie generation. So music, the Jewish music industry sort of went from, it's like awesome, you go to a Deddy concert, you go to KD after, everyone's chilling, it's good, to, you know, a guy like Mordechai Shapiro, Benny Freeman, it's not push it for them to walk down Avenue J or Central Avenue. Yeah. It's just, they're getting a lot of, yeah. you know, a lot of, not lachats, <laughs> a lot of hachakait. I don't know. <laughs> just uh, my glossary. I don't know. Pick I don't a, know if any of my previously featured yeshivish <laughs> words apply in this context. No, okay. Well, it's going through my yeshivish glossary. Then you need to hit the books. You need to study more. But it's just a lot. It's, it's just a lot. It's a lot. There's a lot of the selfies and, right. and the celebrity status, which right. I don't know if always existed. So from your, from your perspective, what has that done to the to the industry? Is it a good thing? Is it maybe not a good thing? Well, the question is, <clears throat> so first of all, there was always a celebrity status. Yeah. Always. I remember when we, I was a little kid, we were driving down 13th Avenue and Mordechai David had just released a, an album and he was standing in front of Mostly Music on 13th Avenue. I remember when we passed by and just seeing him was like... We couldn't be like, wow, that's Mordechai. I saw Mordechai ben David. I'm it's closest, I literally closest I saw it to Malchus. It's unbelievable. Imagine if I thought like that about seeing Reb Chaim Kanievsky or, or or my Rav, you know. But whatever. And he, I think if you saw Reb Chaim standing outside of all, most, most of the music, I probably have the same you'd, reaction. You'd freak yes. out a little bit. Right, I'd freak out. What's he doing here? Like, you know. By the way, which music is he into? Yeah, you know. <laughs> no, but I'm saying so. That status, uh, the idea of of, I don't want to use the word idolizing because it's so not a Jewish word, but I'm going to use it for the sake of conversation. Mm -hmm. Was always there. Meeting an artist in the street was like, oh, wow. I think it just exploded today because of social media. And instead of having a thousand fans, you now have a hundred thousand fans. Yeah. And they live all around you. I've gone out to eat with Mordechai and yeah, with Benny and with Yaakov. And obviously in reserve they cut. They don't have, yeah. and, and, and I, what? <laughs> obviously, obviously in reserve cut. 
We, I've gone, <laughs> yes, I have gone with more, yes, yeah. Quite interesting stories there, but anyway, <laughs> not for podcast. But anyway, no, it was all fun. But they don't have a living second. And I know there is an element that they relish because it, it, it validates them and validates what they're doing and it gives them the push to continue. Hey, you know what? People really do like my music. Because every singer, no matter who you are, every artist in whatever industry you're in, if you're a heady guy, meaning if you're living your head like a composer or an actual artist or a, or a book writer or, or you know an author or whatever it is, you're in your head a lot. And you need that confidence boost. It's not like you're an accountant and, okay, even an accountant needs the, the boss to come and say, hey, good job, Barry, right? Yeah. Barry. Right, exactly. There's but no in, actual Barry. In our industry. There is. My bookkeeper is Barry. You know Barry. Is really? Barry Robin. Yeah. Barry. <laughs> Barry. Look at that. Shout out Barry. Yeah. Right out of that. But in this industry, because you're so public and you really move a lot of people, people come over to me in the streets and, and stores and tell me stories that it's unbelievable. Like I can't even relate that I can't believe that this is doing this to them. Yeah. So they don't mean it in a bad way. I think yeah. it also complicates their life because, you know, I have it in a much smaller uh, form, but they have it in a tremendous form. And, and guess what? It comes along. No one's about to resign and say, I can't deal with this anymore. So yeah. it is part of the package. You got to deal with it. And there's a, I, I searched, I Google something while you were speaking, which I never do, but I want to, I thought this was Nagaya. There was many weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, there was a, in Mishbacha magazine, um, there was a take a stand column and the question that was posed and it was posed of Yossi Zakatinsky of Nelson Muller and Rev. Avraham Weinrib. And the question that was posed was uh, the respect and adulation, they make a claim, this is a claim. And then you have to agree, disagree. The claim is the respect of an adulation displayed by our society, specifically the younger generation for contemporary Jewish music artists is completely misplaced and should be strongly discouraged. Agree, disagree, and why? Wow. So I'm being put on the spot here. Totally. <laughs> With Welcome all to my spot. goodness, I what, put myself on the what spot. What can I say that's going to get people to want to buy more songs from me? Okay, here's my whole <laughs> list. Yeah. Here we go. No, so obviously in, in any statement, you have to be able to understand what someone's answering, their, what, where they're coming from. The re, again, no one's right. No one's answer is There's no wrong right, answer. And there is no right answer. But I, I think when something comes to such an extreme... You do have to take a step back and say, okay, why is this happening? What's the reason? Um, but the reason is because music is so prevalent in our lives and we see these singers every night and it's such a hack to see them. I got to see Mordecai David one time standing for most of music. Now, you know, if you go to this wedding or that wedding, this concert, yeah, that concert. It's constant. Um, right. I don't know. Again, I don't think idolizing anybody is good. I, I think it's wrong. I think is adulation like what the, is that? I don't even know that word. What is adulation? Adulation means to look up to someone, to put someone up on a pedestal. So that's not idolizing. I don't think it's right, idolizing. Different, different word. Right. I think adulation here in this case is they're looking. They're not really looking up to them. I think that what they're te what what these what the youth is saying here is, I love your music, and therefore I enjoy your presence. Or right. I enjoy yeah, I respect yeah. being in, in a picture with you because that reminds me of how much I love your music. You li listen. I'd rather they have adul adulation for. Mordechai Shapiro or this guy, that guy, than anyone playing on the radio, right? You definitely, and, and people say, well, you can't go that route. You need to go that route because right. today's day and age, if you don't give it to them, guess where they're going? But it's, yes, I think in the home, I, I always say, chinuch starts at home. It doesn't start in the yeshivas. You got to start at home. So every parent has to know their child. They have to know what their child needs. Uh, speaking as a parent, I'm speaking as my own, my own home. And you have to know if you feel your kids are getting a little bit out of hand or you think it's going that direction and you think you can guide them to a balanced idea of what a singer is and what to take out of a song, fine. But it's hard to whitewash the whole society today. Well, what do you think? It's not fair. I should just put Shif him on. Shifting I, roles I should just here. put Yitzi on the spot. I usually ask the questions. I know. I'm just... Uh, I think that artists, Jewish music artists, are doing an incredibly important avoida. And that Avoida is bringing their listeners closer to the Abishter, period. I don't care what genre they're in. Mm -hmm. That is that is the Avoida. That's the exercise that they're engaged in. And the ones that are successful are the ones that do that. Right. And people that enjoy Jewish music, they are connecting with their neshama. Right. And we had Mordechai Shapiro on the show, and he's he's done an excellent job of pushing the envelope in terms mm -hmm. of genre of music. Right. But at the core of his Avoida is halogicity pulsating through his music. I could tell you. That's I what know. he's doing. I'm sorry. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I, I know 
Baruch Hashem, I'm friends with Kamada, I could say, every single singer in the industry on a very personal basis, on a very personal level. I'd like to think I'm very close friends with all these guys, and I know them, I know their hearts intimately, and they're all tzaddikim, every single one of them. And it's easy to, you know, say, yeah, this guy, that guy, okay, maybe because his music is reaching certain people, and, but everybody in their homes, everyone in their hearts know where their little issues are. Um, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, every one of these people are doing this for, obviously, Parnassa. Parnassa is important. you got to pay for your bills. Um, but they're all tzaddikim. Every single one of these people are just tzaddikim. Every single one. It's yeah. amazing. There's another quote here. I don't know where it's quoted from, to be honest. It says, it says Adulation for entertainers has no place in Yanishkai. We revere Gadol and we run after them. We look up to them. We talk about them, but not entertainers. So I disagree with that. I think that there's many, you know, <laughs> I think there's many performers and artists in the industry that it's not a steer to look up to uh, an artist and then look up to a rav. It's not a contradiction. Right. You look, just because someone looks up to Joey Newcomb and then they look up to Rav Fryan Waxman, it's not... I don't think anybody actually looks up to... Yaakov Shwaki and Reb Chaim can ask it the same way. Right. It's, it's different compartments. One is... It's a, harmony, no? Is one is <laughs> Very right. deep. Good. Very deep. Good. Whatever. You were not flat on that note. But anyway, <laughs> my point uh, all is... All my other notes are right. pretty flat. My point is that w- when everyone knows that there is nothing but the Torah, that's... Everything is the Torah. So when you go into a gadol, usually standing and you're sweating, you're, everyone knows this, your face gets hot and... You're waiting for that bracha and you, you feel like you're with the Shekhinah. And then you come out into your car and you, you listen to Mordech Hashpir, Yaakov Shweki, this one, that doesn't matter. And it's just, just because I want to I be inspired. It's a different thing. No one's actually saying that it's the same level of adulation. People have waited three hours to go into a Chaim or the other G'daylam. No one's waiting three hours to go into a concert. Mm-hmm. Right? It's, it's not the same thing. Right. And, and Klal Yisrael is big and, and no one is conflating those roles. And if someone right. runs up to Yaakov Shweki and has that uh, impulse to take a, a selfie. If if that's coming from an immaturity, then people go through growth. Right. People go through no, no, development yeah. and there's maturity and there's immaturity and people grow. Right. And that same person that took that selfie with Yaakov Shweki, maybe when they were having an immature moment later on in their life, maybe later on that week will listen to we are a miracle and will start crying. Right. Right. Because he's accessed their neshama right. through that song. Right. This is all, they're, they're, they have adulation with people who talk to them on a spiritual level. And I don't see anything wrong with that. That's Again, what I, idolizing yeah. is wrong, meaning constant fixation on... Well, idolizing on, on, anything is... Right, right. But, but having respect and enjoying what this guy's doing to my neshama. We're not talking about someone who's doing pedicures. We're talking right. about someone who's fixing your neshama with song. So that, that's pretty much what Rabbi Yossi Zakatinsky alluded to is like agree, disagree, or why? Like, let's just go to like, well, why are they, you know, mm-hmm. right. ad- and this is agilizing, with, yeah, agilizing, yeah. adulating. It's a good stretch. It's a, <laughs> it's a for effort on that one. And this is with all of the due respect for people that give pedicures <laughs> because yes. we all know the importance. Never been to one. <laughs> you know what I mean though? Oh, have you? You've never been to one? <laughs> no. Oh, well. I've had a pedicure. <laughs> Full disclosure, yeah, I have. It's always when I'm away, though. Not Brave. like on Central Avenue. You, if I'm away. You know that, that thing in Eretz Yisrael, you put your foot in the fish tank thingy and they eat your, the fish, is that considered a pedicure? It is, absolutely. Oh, man. It's kind of fishy situation. If they're licensed fish. Guilty. It's a fishy pedicure. <laughs> Very deep. It's, uh, no polish, but yeah, just cleaning up the toes. Sure. What's the percentage of men getting pedicures? Don't I don't start know. that poll, please. No, I'm not going to dig into that right now. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm curious from... You think, you know, you look back at your sort of your career and which is Baruch Hashem still rocking and rolling. Um, and there are songs even recently which you've written that are next level. I know a re- uh, recent, rather recent, a song that you wrote. And I, I, I really hope it's the song that you wrote. I think it is. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> is this the part where you said the name of the song? Uh, <laughs> I'm like stalling, you know? I'm on pins and needles here. Yeah. Here we go. <sighs> to Vila Sineris. Yes. Oh, thank God. Okay. Thank you. Ashen. So that the song like that, like I 
by my wedding, I by my chuppah, you know, I I, I walked down to it. It's like nowadays the chuppah is tricky. Like you get to play a song before the chuppah, and then you walk down to something, and then uh, yeah, it's a whole concert. It's like today. Eight, yeah, it's a whole concert. So that was like my pre pre show concert. <clears throat> Such a beautiful, just a beautiful niggin. I'm curious from all the songs that you've written. You knew I was going to ask you this at one mm-hmm. point. And I'm going to ask you, and there's going to be a song that pops up into your head. I want you to answer that. Mm-hmm. What's the song that touches you the most? Um, I'd probably say the song Ash is Chayal I mentioned before is a song that I'm probably one of my top. I mean, again, it's hard to say the most because when you have three, 400 songs published, it's very hard to have one song. Yeah, and I've worked with Hashem, Baruch Hashem with all the artists come out. But I did a song with Free that I also speaks to my heart immensely. Kishoshana, you know the song. Kishoshana, Kishoshana, Benachachem. You're singing harmony again. I'm gonna. Erroneous. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell your father. I'm glad I haven't changed. <laughs> but that um, was the melody. No, that yeah. was not the melody. That, that was, was the melody. that was harmony. No, that, no, was, that was the melody. I thought you were joking. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the Let's out. Let's go with that. <laughs> but anyway, um, so that is a song that speaks to me tremendously, Ashes Chayel, and a song I, I actually performed that has, Phil Sashla. Oh, it's a beautiful uh, song. It's a song that uh, speaks to me tremendously. So it doesn't mean, you know, it's very hard to answer that. But if I have to put number one, probably Ashes Chayel, for so whatever reason, I don't know why, it just... I think uh, Jerry Seinfeld me. was once asked, what's his favorite joke? Reb, Jerry? Sorry. Yeah, Biasala. I asked uh, Jerry Seinfeld once what, what was his favorite joke that he ever wrote, and he was like, "I don't know, what was my favorite breath of air?" Which everyone gets me to the next <laughs> one. <laughs> very I relate good. to that because it's a very <laughs> difficult question to answer. When people ask, when people ask me like, "What's our favorite episode?" I my answer always is, and I really believe it. it, it I believe it. I really mean it. <laughs> is uh, I don't know. This week it's something else. Next week it's gonna change. Like like it literally. That's like one week I have an affinity towards this Indian and this topic and this guest and the next week it changes. Right. Complete 180 sometimes. Right. So, you know, yeah. and as much as song is, as you mentioned, the language of the soul and expression of the heart, it's, it's almost impossible to characterize a favorite right. because of how complex right. our emotions right. are. Like the song you mentioned, Tulsa Neris, it's a stunning song. I mean, if I listen to my car, I'm like, wow, I can't get over how good this actually came out. And you, so, yeah, and you're also able to take someone who is really young at that point, Moshe Tischler, right, right. who's getting, you know, getting on the scene, and you gave him this gem. <clears throat> yeah, he fought me in studio because he didn't want to, Moshe, I love you. you know, I'm saying <laughs> this in a good way. He didn't want to sing that light flavor when we came in because I, I kind of produced the whole track for him, and we sang in the studio, and we worked it out. And he was like, no, I sing, you know, I sing full voice. Yeah. Like, just Go there, go there, trust it, me. It was so, it was Let's so paint a picture. Let's do an emotional picture. And now he tells me, he says, oh, I wish I could do that again. He said, that's uh, just... And you sang on that song with him. Did you? Um, no, I don't think I did. Or maybe it's just that like his voice went so light that it sounded like you. Could be right, right. You, you right. have, and, and I don't know if this, I really don't think this applies to all composers. Definitely not to my brother. He's not a singer. My brother doesn't even play any instruments. Like he mm-hmm. composed a couple songs. He never played any instruments. You have a really, really stunning voice. Thank you. And and so I would say that you're like sacrificing that end of things, throwing yourself into the, the composition end. Right. So a sing well, of late I have been doing more uh, right. live. I've been trying to angle my career a little bit more to, you know, representation of my songs and maybe coming out with new stuff, Mitzvah Shem, from my own. You were genre. awesome at Hask, by the way, in that, yeah. in that Thank role. you. Thank you. But, but even at Hask, it was still a very limited role and I couldn't really expect get into the crowd and express myself. You know, I hope one day to be able to have enough. You want like a, like a Yitzi Wallner piano, you and the piano, two hours, just like jamming away. Right. And like doesn't Romberg, to be piano. I mean, yeah. I think I can engage with the crowd and, and I think I could do new songs that'll be more me. Like Tatlika Daesh is not, my soul isn't Tatlika Daesh, but it's not, it's not me. It's not my identity. Right. Or at your code or, or, you know, so many other songs, fast songs, whatever. But, I feel like I could do songs that are a little bit more me. Uh, What's that? In Come my on. identity. Give me something. So we said like a Shoshana, you know, I do a lot of my own stuff. It's just Chayil. But even though I haven't done anything fast yet of my own, but I think I, I think I could bring messages that I'll bring a little bit more of me out into the song. Um, what's that What's that you that you, you want people to know? No, so I, I'm saying, just go back to what you mentioned about, I think I'm sacrificing. At the end of the day, when you're writing music, that's pure artistry. 
Yeah. When you're singing, you're a singer. Now, don't get me wrong. These singers have changed the world. But if you look around the world today with Isha Ribo, Akiva, and, and, and especially in, in, the, in, the, in the world of music, singer-songwriters do specifically very well. Because they're they're not just getting up singing, you know, blah blah blah. You know, they're they're actually it's their heart. Their yeah. heart is coming out in their voice, and that's how I'm going to lift you up. So that's kind of right. If for, I'm going to sing, that's really more where I want to be. Right. For artists like that, it's very rare almost for them to sing a song that they didn't write. Correct. Right. Correct. Right. Right. I'm here for it. I would love to see you do that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I have to I have to get enough confidence that more enough people want to want to hear it. <laughs> It's a shame, you know, I've, I've, I've started the process more and more and hopefully the, the opportunities will Feel free to itself. utilize the comments section mm. of the episode. <laughs> yes. To respond. People, yeah. Poll. Make, sure, yeah. make sure you give the confidence in this one. Um, we'll be right back to this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. But no, 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 I will not let them go. I will not let you go anywhere through the Safer Shmos without picking up this book, The Safer, Let My Nation Go. It is an amazing series from Feldheim. Uh, this book is written by Ray Yosef Deutsch, and it is incredible. It is beautiful. It, it reads like a novel, yet inspires like a safer. And it's really thorough. It's educational. Just get your hands on this safer. Get your hands on this book. On this book. Turn through the pages. Your kids will love it, and you'll have what to say at the Shabbos table. Trust me. It's really an amazing piece, and we're going to give you a promo code. 10% off, plus free shipping if you use... Let my nation MP. That's let my nation MP. I think the MP stands for meaningful people. That's a let my nation MP for 10% off plus free shipping. Feldheim does it again with an incredible series. So go ahead, feldheim.com or hit the link in the show notes in the description of this episode. Hit that link, get this book. You're going to love it. Now, enjoy the rest of this episode. Has there been any stories that stand out to you in your career, whether it's, uh, you know, a story with, I know you spend a lot of time with, with uh, the create, you know, the, uh, the <clears throat> singers and performers, or maybe it's something that, you know, in passing with a fan, is there a story that stands out to you? Like, oh, that happened. That was. So too many to say, but there's one story that's just, you know, people say, prove to me there's a, there's a God, there's a Shem, which, which really is the dumbest question because. Nachi gets that question all the time. Right, proof right. to me. And really, I, I could do? tell you a thousand stories right now, which logically and mathematically don't add up. And here's one. So there was a time where, like every other year, I was on Amazon. And um, you weren't on Amazon? Really? I wasn't. <laughs> I think my siblings once tried selling me on Amazon, but I didn't <laughs> But do Amazon was involved. So there you go. Amazon okay. was involved. Like, <laughs> That's my point. I didn't do Amazon, but okay, I was but on anyways, Amazon. So I, was, I was selling creams on Amazon, you know, with Dead Sea creams from, from Israel and whatever. And... So uh, I was buying small lots. Really, I wasn't buying items off the, you know, from a proper distributor. I was just buying small lots this years ago, closeout deals, and then trying to have more of a control on that market than that particular brand and whatever. So there was this, this, this uh, guy calls me from Miami, and he says that he's here from Metzestral, and he's, um, he has a lot. He was some rabbi recommended him, actually a rabbi that I produced, uh, one of his relatives, uh, his son, Rabbi, rabbi Amar, Amar years ago, and um, he told me to give you a call, and um, he would like to, uh, I, I have a such and such a lot that you want to buy. He sends me the list, I'm looking it up, with my wife going online, trying to check everything out, yeah, adds up, I think we could do well over here, and okay, what do you want, $4,000, blah, 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 okay, fine, he says, I'm going to, I'm come driving down from Miami to New York, to Jersey, can we come next Tuesday? I said, who's we? He says, if you don't mind, I'm going to come with my fiance, she works, for, she works with me. He says, oh, no problem. So he comes in and we're schlepping all the boxes and I'm going over all the, in, the, you know, the inventory to make sure that everything adds up. And, and that was before I had my studio and this in the, my, my basement, my main room, and she sees a, a keyboard there, a piano. And she says, ah, you play for kids? I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> I'm not play for kids. Come on. Well, you know, I'm a songwriter, I'm I write songs. And um, she says, oh, you know, anything I might know? So again, being that she's Israeli, I right away went to, you know, maybe you know Yaakov Shweki. She knows she's, they're not from really. She says, no, never heard of it. And I don't even know why I said this. I said, uh, maybe you know the song. And she starts crying. I'm like, oops, what did I say? <laughs> so she sits down on the couch. She says, you know, a year ago my sister got married and, you know, we're not from. And I'm sitting there and she's walking down to the chuppah and she's walking down to this song. 
I'm sick of She said, I don't know why. I just started welling up. And I said, when I get married, I'm going to walk down to this song. Wow. And she said, it moved us so much that she got close to a rabbi in Miami, a different rabbi, and they're starting to become more from. And she says, here's my husband, and we're going to move, walk down to the song. From all the people in the world, she winds up at the guy who wrote the song <laughs> in the basement in Lakewood. Like, come on. Prove to me there's a guy. You out of your mind. Wow. <laughs> what so are nice. the mathematical, if anybody's watching, what are the mathematical equations? There's no equation there's no to that. There's no equation. Wow. Seven billion people in the world. The Jewish nation is like we big, right? And, and close to eight, by the way. Eight billion Coming people, right? Eight. We're not even a point fraction percent of the world's population. And I wrote that song 10 years ago, 12, I don't know how many years ago. And the woman that changed her life because of it wound up in my basement selling me an Amazon item and nothing to do with music. And just because my keyboard was there, that came out. That's incredible. Wow. That's you, really special. You mentioned uh, being Mal and Itzitzis on Amazon. Ooh, he's in the Itzitzis. An, an like unrelated that. story other than just um, Eli and Itzitzis on Amazon. I heard a story, and, and our listeners, I'm sure, will correct me on the details, but someone listed a whole batch of iPads on Amazon, and there was a typo where the price was like grossly understated. And the username, the seller name, had Bardichev in the username. I think it was like seventy dollars instead of seven hundred. Something, something like crazy, like <laughs> a, a flagrant typo. Wow! On these iPads, and he wakes up the next morning and he sees that is uh, sold out. So first he's excited. Oh yeah, my, right. my whole stock. Is- then he's in debt. Yeah, <laughs> big time. Then he looks and he sees what it was. What it was priced at. His mom is Sabrochen. Gets a call. Gets a reach out. Some yid in Lakewood, and I, I don't know who it, who it is, who it was, maybe some of our listeners know, contacted him and said, I noticed Bardichev in your username. You don't want to lose money. I saw that you made the typo. I bought the entire inventory. So that you don't lose So that I could give so it, I back, give it to back to you. It's amazing. Give it back to you. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And you found this, this woman... She also. found me. It's unbelievable. And I don't even know why I picked that song from all songs. Like, why, how would right? she even know the song? It's amazing. And that song actually did, I mean, what it, it yeah. sold over the entire world. From, none from, doesn't matter. It's every single night, weddings. Very nice. That's really beautiful. As we wind down this episode, I want to ask you, um, is there any specific artist, singer, performer, writer that is no longer alive that you would want to sit down to sit, sit down with and just speak to and just uh, pick their brain and, and ask questions to? Oh, that is a good question. Um, never really had a chance to even think of We can sing like a nigga while you think of an answer. <laughs> good. Do, um, no, no, no. I mean, I, 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 listen. There, you know, you always wish you had the opportunity going back to have an appreciation for the people that were alive at the time, you know? grandfathers and whatever you wish you can know them now but um i think i would have loved to pick a little bit of Benzina Schenker's brain Shalom, to see what how, how he was able to write so many uh songs that just and every one of them just stuck right you know just to be able to to see what made his neshama tick that's really what i, I would love to see how someone like that works um shama kalbach i think might be a little bit easier to figure out but Still, you know, same idea. How did he write so many songs that it just seems to be such a nitzchir that just keeps going? You know, the Kabach Minyanim and the Kabach this and the Kabach that. With such so simplicity. That, such simplicity. And, and that's really all hard. You know, it's really all hard. And, and, and I think he spoke to a generation. But I think even more so, he's, even today, everyone's just still keeps going. And going I heard a word that Shlomo Karbach, and this maybe could be a, it was a segula for the longevity of his music. And I don't know if it's true, but this is what I heard that he had never listened to non-Jewish music. Right, right. I've heard that too. And so the, 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 the real core of everything he wrote was pure. It was pure. There's another story of Shlomo. My father used to have a radio program. Um, I think JM and the AM prior to Nachum Siegel. And my father had Rav Shlomo Karbach in the studio many times. And, and he would speak to him about, you know, your songwriting process. And Shlomo Karbach said, I write, I, I write tens and tens of songs a day. When I'm on the bus, I write. I'm on this, I write. I'm on the train, I write. So my father said to him, did you write anything on the way here today to the studio? And he said, in fact, I did. 
He's like, could you play it for us? He says, sure. And he takes out his guitar and he starts singing, David Melech. No way. Melech Yisro. Oh my gosh. David Melech. And we have it on a cassette. Goodbye. And it's just like, it's it was like, you know, first of all, that's one of those songs that you feel like, hey, well, like, Avram Bina wrote that. No, like, it's <laughs> like, like, who wrote Yigdal? Who, who, Hashem? Like, Avram Bina wrote it about David Amalek. I love the, <laughs> the historical. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's, it's really fascinating. I'm over, I often wonder. It's like a matriz. You could be one off. Yeah, with the coil. <laughs> I put him with the coil. I, will, I often wonder if these songs, would, how they would do today, if they would be introduced for the first time in today's generation. Um, I'm curious to like. I think that there's a new theme. Like people are really interested, especially like with 24 six, like this new app. Mm-hmm. Which I know you're very involved in. Like, I go on it, and there's this new, you know, the oldies. Oh, the nostalgic love, is great. Yeah, the nostalgic stuff, and I love That's getting in the cool. car. It's unbelievable! It's unbelievable. It's like Dvekas, you know, and like, yeah. let me hear a young Revi. Come on, Revi, belt it out. You it's know? really amazing. I grew up with Regesh with Abish Brat, and and I wow. I, I Davin right next to him. I sit next to him in, in Lakewood now, and he records by me. And as a matter of fact, I had last year I had him and Rashmul Brazil in the studio together. And it was to you me live it was near like, Abish? I live next to yeah, not far. Oh, so my wife's grandparents moved right next door from they lived in Bar Park for decades. They moved right next door to Abish Brat. My wife's grandfather was uh Rupert's Frankel, Sprenal of Racha. Oh, wow. His wife still lives right there next We're door. At Amanash every day. Give out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wanna give out their address? <laughs> no? I just got genuinely excited about that for some reason. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. But you probably have really cool experiences. Like you have really, really cool experiences. Like you get to be in a room and there's, there's, there could be the A.B. Rottenberg, there could be the Rivi Schwebel, there could be uh, the Mordechai Shapiro, the Simchaliner. And it's just like so many different styles and flavors coming together. Right. And when you, you know, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, I love sitting with them because... You know, I used to, way back when I started, I used to, I never wanted to meet anybody. I was always nervous. So I used to make these demos and then send them out. And I said, okay, so we like the first third part, of, the first part of the verse. Yeah. <laughs> I like, okay, so the verse is, no, not the verse, half of the verse. Okay. <laughs> I said, you know how much time I put into this demo? <laughs> and this happened many times. I said, okay, you know what, guys, listen, how about we sit down? Let me see your face. Let me see what moves you. Let me really get into it. And I had to trust myself the first few times that I was nervous. And then when you get into it and you start realizing it's about connection and it's about, you know, let the connection, let the spirituality, let the, let the lyrics flow, let it go. Don't remove yourself from the equation and just let it happen. Yeah. So, you know, Jakob and I were very, very close. We we're like brothers. We pretty much grew up in this business together. Um, but I have a great relationship with everybody. You know, you mentioned Morty. You know, we did uh, work on his first album. And then I went on producing his next two albums. Um, and we worked very closely together. I, I, the guy's super talented. So when you're sitting in a room with guys like that, it's cool. It's just it's it's great. And I used to come here to Five Towns. We sit together in his house, and he'd come to my house. And the same thing goes with Liner and Yoni Z and Ray Davidi and all these guys. And it's just it's so much fun. They have so much talent, especially guys that can really sing. It brings a better pr- pr- product out of me as well. Do you shep nacha sometimes when? You think back to that Yochi Brisman uh, interaction about this Shweki kid, and now <laughs> and now you know then you're at Hass Thirty Six and <laughs> he's running out to sing his songs and the place is going wild. Like, does that make you? Yeah, it's it's really nice to see. Uh, and Yaakov and I've been to many Shaku concerts, and he he, he always thinks Yitzi Waldner. He yeah. always thinks Yitzi Waldner. Abach Hashem, you know, on an average lineup, he's singing a lot of you know the songs that I wrote for him, whether it's Mami Benesim or Toast to Life or all those. You know, crazy songs back then, you know, it record and stuff like that, all that. Yeah. And a lot of historic stuff that really have reached around the world. So the connection that we have is more than just a regular average. It's probably the, the longest partnership of any songwriter or singer, probably, you know, forever, I think. It's not transactional. It's, w- it's right, way beyond right, that. Right, 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 right. You know, look, I treat this business as a business. I still treat this business as a business. And everybody knows that, even Yaakov, because at the end of the day, I have bills, it's Parnassa, yes, this is what I do, yeah. it's not another one favors. But there are relationships that are stronger, and relationships that are built just on the song sale. And with Yaakov, it's obviously, it goes past that, you know, we've been through so much together in this industry, and we've seen so much, and so much has happened to the world in the music because of it. So there's that bond that just goes on for a long time. I know you mentioned the winding down already, but I just want to jump back in for a Windy question. Windy dandy. Because what you just said struck me. I imagine that's a challenge compartmentalizing hmm, the yeah. business from the soul 
that is so yeah. critical and integral to the process. It's like yeah. therapy. It's like <laughs> someone's like burying their soul. And it's like it's the forty five minute mark, and they're like, "Sorry, you got to go." <laughs> it's like <laughs> I really care for you, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a brilliant question. I, I really, I really do. Um, it got a little more complicated when I started getting into production, uh, which was probably about eight years ago. Because it could take in forever. Earnest, in yeah. earnest, meaning I did my first project in 1997. I actually found the contract. Mushi Tischler's father was the guy who funded it. Really? Wow. Uh, Gessie Tischler. And we found it, and yeah, he lost money, no question. Was, forget <laughs> about it. But it was a great album. I worked with Shlomi Zeiger. I don't know if you know who Shlomi Zeiger is. We worked, sure. I worked with him. He was the arranger, and my Shilowitz. But in any event, um, I think it's a great question. And that complicated the process a little bit more because when I'm writing a song and I sell it, move on, have a nice day. But when you're producing, it's so much longer and can get very frustrating at times. So yeah, that can put a damper on the, on the inspiration part of it. So sometimes you have to learn how to just separate yourself and going into other meetings, you know, knowing how to schedule your meetings for songwriting, maybe not on the day that you're doing three different vocal sessions, you know. Yeah. So, it, it, but it's, it's a great, I've never thought about that, but it's, it's a great question. So we do here. Uh, and the, la the last question I have, really two part. One is, you know, what's, what do you see as the future for Jewish music? Like, where do you see it going? And, and the second part is, can you, maybe there's an audience out there, some of our listeners uh, that don't listen to Jewish music. They listen to non-Jewish music. And I'm sure being in the seat that you sit in, you can make a compelling case for like why it's, why it's important uh, to listen to maybe Jewish music and right. So uh, the first question you asked me about do I see where I see Jewish music going? I was asked this question not long ago by a magazine, and it's an impossible question to answer. Ten years ago, I probably would have had a much better answer for you. I think with the advent of social media and every Irish guy will jump up and go just for the sake of it going. It's very very difficult to predict exactly what's going to happen, but I think overall the industry is split in two different two different ideas. You have the wedding market, which is a certain genre. Mostly Hasidic dance is very popular there. Yeah, That constantly drives the market in that end. And Hasidic singers and all singers that do weddings, it's, it's a very important part of their business. And if that's where your focus is, then that's that kind of genre you're going to get. Then there is the entertainment or the spiritual value that you want to get, whether you're standing and cooking in the kitchen or whether you're in your office and you hear We Are a Miracle or this song or that song or it doesn't matter, whatever it is, which you're not necessarily going to be into at a wedding. It doesn't go. Right. So that's, I think, a much bigger market. Um, that is more like a concert idea. So which one dictates what? I think there's a, it's a tug of war a little bit. You know, I sit with singers all the time. And they say, you know, what should I do? And there's no really good answer, but it really is what your focus is. What are you trying to accomplish? Oh, the world's going Hasidish today. Really? I don't know. You should, everybody has streamed more than anybody out there. So right. where is the money? Where is the gigs? It's really you have to see what you're good You have at. to stay true to you. You have to stay true to you. When we had Avram I think when you're trying to do something else, it's, yeah. it's complicated. When I mean, we had yeah. Remel on, was, we were saying, is there in the works maybe an, a, a, an album with him and Ishai and this and that? And his answer was, is like, that's not my music. Right. I'm a Hasidic singer right. like that's my music and i and he's mamish sticking to that yeah yeah I've, I've sat with him not too long ago and he's he's very on that case right now he yeah says, why are we going neighbor let's stick to yeah and again he's coming to an understanding that we need to bring this music back but what is this music there's a big lane on there right. you know is it isaac Honic or is it vision or is it uh whatever so yeah. that's one your second question of the importance, the importance of Jewish music over, let's say, right. So the Gemara recounts a story of a Tana. We call them Acher. Acher. And, they should be Avoya. Right. Yeah. And uh, it was someone looked down upon the Gemara and they asked why, because that when he would sit and learn, that he would hum, uh, he would hum. I think it was uh, maybe Roman songs or whatever it was, secular songs. I guarantee you it's not what they play today. Mm. You know, what we might view as secular songs, but I can't, obviously I don't know that for sure. And, um, and the Gemara says that's the reason why he went off the derech is because his heart couldn't connect the Torah 100%. When he was, he was tremendous, he was a Tana. We're talking yeah. about Tanoim here. We're not talking about... So obviously that's a whole different thing. But if we could take something out of that story, you, you know, if you want to really embrace Yiddishkeit, Again, you have to understand what's that other music doing to you. If is it is it doing to you? Is it is it making you feel more Jewish, 
closer to Hashem, you need to be real with yourself. Yeah. And that's really a question with everybody with their own Yitzharas. What is this doing to you? Is it making you closer to Hashem? We all have our, our, you know, our things that we're dealing with. Uh, but in the question of music, it's specifically, it sits in the heart. So if your heart is surrounded by Gaish music, I don't know if Abdus Hashem can penetrate that well. It's a really good answer, and I think that's very thought-provoking for our listeners. Yitzhi Waldner, I really appreciate you giving us the time, making sure. making the trip all the way in. My pleasure. From Thank Lakewood. you for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Rebbe. And Merz Hashem, you should continue, you should continue spreading the good word. Mm-hmm. And Merz Hashem, the eighth note, right? The eighth note, the note that we hear, <laughs> Mashiach, Amen. will have right. your fingerprints on it. Right. Imagine how many more chords will open up with the eighth Oh, my oh. gosh. Oh, my gosh. How Oof. complicated it's going to be for the mixers I'm ready and this bring, and I'm that. already preparing my business card for The that. arrangements yeah. are going to be crazy. Whole new. <laughs> <laughs> can't be massing it yeah, yeah. Shkai, shkai yeah. all the old keyboards will be thrown out <laughs> <laughs> thank shkai. you for having me thank you. I appreciate it thank, thank you. you Rabbi Yitzi how are you Rebbe that was very hailing oh, thank you're talking, you so much you're talking to Yitzi yeah hi Yitzi <laughs> hi Yitzi's family hi hi what you want pizza now interesting thank you so much for coming into the studio all the way from the woods yeah of lakes I was actually visiting my grandmother, who we were talking about, Safta Frankel, Pertz Frankel's wife. You're really having a conversation with him. I was there. Oh, okay. I got oh, so excited during the episode. Oh, when he you, when he mentioned that he's yeah. neighbors with my wife's grandmother, and then the next day I went to visit her. You did? She should be in. Yeah. Did you knock on Yitzhi Walter's door? And I told door? her. I told her. I just sat down with your neighbor. It was so hailing. You didn't knock on his door. I did not knock. I would have done. I would have done ding dong ditch. I would have ring his doorbell just to see what the the doorbell is. Is it gonna be like, ding dong, in like be one of his songs? Is it gonna be Bowie Bishalom, No, or is it gonna be like a regular ding? Head to his address. It's one two eight four Fourth Avenue in Lakewood. It's not his address, guys. Don't go to that address. I don't know whose address that is. Anyways. What is close to sit down with Yitzhi Waldner? He's super halig. He's a yeah. super halig, humble person. Someone who's been in the industry for so long, has written so many gems, all part of his heart, part of his soul. He bears that in this episode, and I know you heard that. Um, just three more reviews needed for a moment to lose his glasses for the next episode. Erroneous. We're very much looking forward to that. And of course, we'll be back at you next week with another episode. Make sure to leave a review, subscribe to this out, to this podcast. And of course, if you'd like to see more content, you can subscribe to WhatsApp Status. Hit the link in the description in the show notes. In the show notes in the description. I think that was your first shout out to a Status. Is it? I don't know. Maybe it is. Well, just hit the down. Or if you're listening, just scroll down in the notes and you'll see a link to a WhatsApp status and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Hope you enjoyed this video from Meaningful Minute. We have so much more content for you. You may like this. You may like this. Take your pick. Let us know what you think.